This is EHJ Today with the uh, Legends in Cardiology series and I have the pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Eugene Brownwald from Harvard Medical School who needs no introduction. So Dr. Brownwald, uh, we're all wondering why did you choose medicine uh, when you were a young student? What made you study medicine and later cardiology? Well, um, um, Tom, I uh, uh, went to high school during World War II. Mm -hmm. And at that period, uh, everything was focused on engineering. Mm -hmm. And so I went to an excellent technical high school in New York. Um, and uh, I enjoyed it. But I felt there was something, some warmth was missing from engineering. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what motivated me to, uh, to go into medicine, to go to medical school. But I, uh, I liked cardiology because, it, you know, it had two aspects of engineering. That's right. Electrical yes. and mechanical. Yes. And uh, so the, um, the mechanical part was uh, the development of cardiac catheterization. Um, and um, the people who were interested in that were considered uh, called plumbers. Right. And those interested in uh, electrical, electrocardiography and then electrophysiology were called electricians. So the, the, the ties between engineering uh, and cardiology are very profound. Right. And at that time, physics and uh, pressure measurements were very important, less so than today, the molecular mechanisms, was it? Absolutely. Yeah, so physiology was the queen of the sciences. Physiology reigned supreme, and, uh, uh, and uh, studies of the whole heart, an isolated heart, um, and uh, obviously of patients by means of he hemodynamics, uh, was how I got into the field. And who was a role model for you? Who motivated you at that time? I think that um, uh, the most important person was uh, a man by the name of Ludwig Eichner, Professor Eichner. I went to New York University and uh, he uh, was the director of a catheterization laboratory, uh, which at that time was a research laboratory, not a diagnostic laboratory. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I worked there as a student. Mm -hmm. And uh, that got me. And he worked on congestive heart failure, so became interested in pumping function uh, and uh, dysfunction of of the heart. Uh, really, as a student, and uh, he sort of showed me the way. And then one thing led to another. I had a postdoc fellowship with Andre Cournan the year he yes. before he won a Nobel Prize, right. which was exciting. And um, then I went to the NIH. And uh, I continued my work. I went into uh, physiology, but again, it was whole heart physiology under Stanley Sarnoff, who was a wonderful mentor. Yeah. And how did cardiology then change, let's say, in the early 80s and 90s? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the changes uh, have been profound. I think that, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, it's been... Uh, you know, we've moved from the whole organ to the tissue, to the cell, yes. uh, and to the molecule. And I think that uh, cardiovascular research has progressed in that direction. It has also progressed in another direction. We're now large, studying large populations. Right. So, it, it, you know, there was a time when uh, many of the papers that we published in the 60s when I worked at the NIH, you know, were of 15, 20 patients. You could hardly publish today. <laughs> right. And that would uh, uh, not be publishable today. So uh, you'd either now study molecular mechanisms from uh, a ca single cardiac cell or a, a paper that we presented here, our group uh, just um, uh, about a half hour ago that involved uh, 21,000 patients. Yeah, so, the, so these are the changes that have occurred in the field. And of course, the care of patients has increased profoundly. Yes. What made you start all these trials? This was something new then in your career. It was. It was a change for me. Uh, and I made that switch. I closed my animal laboratory in uh, 1984. Mm -hmm. So I had been working um, uh, when I came to the NIH uh, in Sarnoff's laboratory, the major project that the whole group had was to uh, identify 
the determinants of myocardial oxygen consumption. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked on that in his laboratory, and then when I had my own laboratory, continued that. And that got me very interested in ischemia. Yes. Uh, so oxygen consumption, I mean, ischemia, of course, is an imbalance between supply and demand. And then I became interested, our group became interested when I moved to California in, um, uh, in um, uh, protecting ischemic myocardium and uh, affecting infarct size. Yes, exactly. And um, so uh, that's work that began around 1970. And uh, we did many animal experiments, and uh, around the time of 19, in the early 80s, um, thrombolytic therapy began. Right. And I said, okay, now it's time. We've, I've been working in the lab for 25 years. Uh, you know, either this works in patients or it doesn't. Yes. So I folded up my um, uh, animal laboratory and I became uh, the principal investigator of a trial that was called thrombolysis in myocardial infarction. Timmy. Timmy. That's right. We didn't give it a number. Yeah. Uh, Initially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it was Timmy like uh, uh, you had to have Timmy two to give Timmy one a number. Of course, yeah. It's the same thing that uh, World War I yeah. was called a world war. Yeah. It didn't get the one until it World War II. One. That's right. Yeah. So it was the te yeah. second Timmy trial. And then we have been working on this. And as I just mentioned, we had a presentation of one of our uh, very good people who was the PI on a trial, Bob Giuliano. Uh, and that was the Timmy 48 trial, so we've been going ever since. 48 trials, yeah. yeah. 40, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, um, so that was a shift for me. Yes. It was, I would say, a 90 degree shift. Yeah. I mean, the, the goal was the same. Right. The goal was uh, how can we improve first with thrombolysis, then obviously when uh, a PCI came along, uh, uh, how can we improve uh, balance and also you know, we also have had some studies on reperfusion injury. Yes, exactly. um, uh, so the goal really, you know, my interest in reducing infarct size really goes back. Uh, our first studies began in 69 yeah. in animals and then the switch to uh, patients in 84. So this is really translational. It's really translational. But, you know, the theme is, is, is one that you know, has been going on for a long time. It's just that we're looking at a different system. But you, same idea. Same idea. That's great. Yeah. Which of the trials you're most proud of? Uh, the trial that I'm most proud of uh, is a SAVE trial, which uh, um, we did together with uh, Mark Pfeffer. Mark, yeah, yeah uh, because this was really, uh, we were looking at infarct size. We, um, uh, we uh, described in the rat uh, the remodeling exactly. of infarction. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, this is when ACE inhibitors came along mm -hmm. in uh, 1979. Mm -hmm. And we began with Mark. Bushman and Dondetti and. Yes, at, yeah. at, uh, at, at Squibb. Yeah, at Squibb. Yeah, now Bristol Myers Squibb. And um, we got small quantities of it. And uh, so I was working with Mark and uh, Janice Pfeffer, his late first wife, yes. uh, because they had the technique of working of hemodynamics in the rat. And uh, uh, we found, uh, after describing the fact that, that there was remodeling of uh, the rat ventricle, we found that Captopril, which was the first available ACE inhibitor, uh, prevented this remodeling. And we did a, what, a sort of clinical trial, survival trial right. in rats and found that it improved survival. Okay. And then we went into patients. Did the same we, thing in patients. Yeah, that's right. So we, we, we studied end diastolic volume and uh, in patients who had had an MI and we studied them a year apart, either placebo, it was a blinded trial, placebo, or Captopril, okay. measured left ventricular and diastolic and systolic volume, found there was a difference, and then moved into the SAFE trial, which involved what is now a small number of patients, um, uh, about uh, 3,200 patients, yeah, yeah. and found that uh, long-term survival, not just uh, uh, remodeling, was improved. Right. And so this occurred over 
uh, about a um, uh, twelve-year period, beginning with the uh, with the remodeling of the rat left ventricle with infarction, taking it all the way to in improved survival. So nice project. That was wonderful because it went all the way, and of course. I think the Pfeffers did this deserve the major credit right. for this. Right. So for young people that are now at the beginning of their career, where do you think is cardiology going and uh, where, where are the most promising areas? Well, I, um, uh, I think this next period is going to be very exciting. Um, you, know, in, you know, I've been in cardiology for 60 years and uh, I have heard for 60 years people saying, well, all the interesting things have already been done. <laughs> Where are we going now? Right. And I hear the same thing now, you know, my God, you know, the, uh, the mortality from myocardial infarction is so low and there, there's no place to go. I think I, I see two areas. I think um, uh, if, I think the future of cardiology is early prevention. Right. Um, and by early prevention, I mean primordial mm -hmm. prevention. The uh, um, uh, studying the genome and predicting, not treating hypertension, but preventing hypertension. Mm -hmm. In other words, preventing the well-known risk factors. Yes. Before they actually ensue. Before they ensue, that's right. Because it's one thing to treat a 50-year-old man who presents with hypertension, you really want to get at him. And the same thing with lipids sure. and all across the, the way. Yeah, th and that's going to be, that clearly is going to become possible. Not in the, you know, it may take 20 years, but that's what's going to happen. On the other side, that is when in the presence of really end-stage heart failure, I am very excited about uh, the work that uh, the group in Berlin has done at the Heart Center and the work that uh, Magdi Yacoub mm -hmm. and Emma Burks mm -hmm. started at Harefield and that she is now continuing in Louisville, namely uh, the concept of, um, of um, uh, having v VAD and explanting the VAD. So my notion of what I think can be done is once we cross the divide and can transmit power externally without a wire, um, then perhaps patients can have a VAD earlier, right. not as the last stage, yeah. and rest the heart. Destination therapy, certain. Yes. yes, but then, uh, but after perhaps six months of rest, remove the device. Yes. Yeah. And I think that that is going to be possible. So that might mean, um, you know, if you have a broken bone, you rest it for a while. And then it recovers. And then it recovers. And I think, uh, of course, the late stage myocardial disease doesn't recover. But I think earlier. we'll have to move earlier. But of course, to do that, we have to have something that is much safer and much less expensive. And I think that's going to happen. So that's back to engineering. Back to engineering, exactly. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Brownwell. That Thank was you. very enlightening.